Today we'll be looking at elimination and as usual, we'll start with a quiz. A client who underwent surgical repair of an abdominal aortic aneurysm is one day post-op. The nurse performs an abdominal assessment and notes the absence of bowel sound. Again, which action should the nurse take? So you want to think even without the options, what would I want to do if I'm carrying out an assessment, an abdominal assessment, and I note that my client doesn't have a bowel sound. I'll be thinking towards the lines of what should I do? What should I not do? Okay, so if we look at the options, it says start the client on um, sips of water, remove the end to call the primary healthcare provider, document the finding. So again, if we go through it using our um, priority steps, which we'll try to leave out for now so that we're able to cover as much as possible, just look at the options. You want to start the client on sips of water in option one. Would this be a correct action for a client with absent bowel sounds one day post-op? No. The client is usually kept neoperoral until after the onset of bowel sounds. So I'm going to eliminate option one. How about option two? Remove the NG tube. Again, you ask yourself, is this correct action for a client with absent, absent bowel sounds one day post-op? No. This would not be right. The NG tube should stay in place if present. Again, the nurse does not remove the tube without a prescription to do so. So I'm also going to eliminate option two. And then I go to option three, call the primary healthcare provider. Would this be your priority action? Would this be the correct action for a client with absent bowel sounds one day post-op? At the moment, there's no need to call the primary health uh, primary healthcare provider. So I'm going to also eliminate this again document the findings and continue to assess for bowel sounds. Would that be your correct action for a client one day post-op without bowel sounds? Yes, we know that bowel sounds may be absent for three to four days post-operatively because of uh, the bowel manipulation that has occurred during surgery. So the nurse at the moment doesn't need to do anything. She just needs to document the finding and continue to monitor the client and assess for bowel sounds. So option four would be our correct answer. So in terms of bowel elimination, with normal bowel elimination, what assessment findings do you want to see if everything is going as it should? The abdomen should be non-tender, it should be symmetrical. If you listen to the abdominal sounds, you should hear high-pitched goggles, which indicate normal peristalsis. If we assess our client's tool, this tool should be light to dark brown in color, and you can run a Gaia test. So this would be our Gaia test here. Uh, and it should be negative for occult blood. Remember your Gaia test detects the presence of fecal occult blood. So usually they, they place a fecal sample on the Gaia paper and hydrogen peroxide is applied. And in the presence of blood, it will yield a blue reaction within seconds. So that would be a positive Gaia test. If you have that blue um, coloration, once you apply the hydrogen peroxide. So normally you should have negative GAIAC. There should be no blood in your stool. Again, it should also be negative for fat, mucus, pores, and even pathogens. So how can we promote normal elimination in our clients? You want to teach the client to respond to the urge to defecate as soon as they have that urge. You don't want them holding onto their stool and getting constipated or impacted. So they need to, you need to teach them to respond to the urge to defecate. You also want to provide facilities, provide privacy, and allow your client sufficient time to evacuate their bowels. We also need to provide and encourage adequate fluid intake. At least they should take between eight or more glasses of fluid daily. You can give hot liquids and even fruit juices. So this would also help with uh, elimination, bowel elimination. In terms of foods, we need to encourage fiber. You need to encourage fruits. You need to encourage vegetables and grain. We want our client to be active. So you want to encourage exercise. You want to encourage ambulation. Remember, this would all help to maintain muscle tone. You also want to teach the client that stress affects the autonomic nervous system. And this in turn controls peristalsis. So you want to teach them on how they need to manage their stress, how they need to control uh, their emotional states. In terms of positioning, 
If your client is ambulatory or bedridden, you need to teach them how they can evacuate their bowels. For example, the client who is ambulatory, you want to teach them that bowel or that optimal posture is when they have their feet flat on the floor and the hips and the knees flexed, just as you would sit if you are sitting in the toilet. So you want to have your feet flat on the floor with your hips and your knees flexed. But for the bedridden clients, you always want to place the client in Fowler's position on their bedpan. So some very important terms we need to know for urinary elimination. We say our client is anuric or there's anuria if the total urinary output in 24 hours is less than 100 mils. So if your client is not able to make up to 100 mils in 24 hours, the client is anuric. Oliguria would be where the total urinary output is between 100 to 400 mils in 24 hours. So that would be oliguria. The total urinary output is between 100 to 400 mils in 24 hours. And polyuria would be where the urine output, the total urinary output is greater than 2,000 mils in 24 hours. So again, anuria less than 100 mils, polyuria greater than 2,000 mils, oliguria between 100 and 400 mils, while dysuria will be difficult, painful, or difficult voiding. So those terms you need to know with your client. As part of our assessment for uh, our client's urine, we want to look at the characteristics of the urine. It should be yellow in color, just like we have. It should be clear. It should be transparent. Your specific gravity should be between 1.010 to 1.030. So you want your specific gravity to be between 1.010 to 1.030. Remember, anything above uh, 1.030 tells you your client is what dehydrated. So you want to remember high and dry, high and dry, high specific gravity, the dry telling you your client is dry, is dehydrated. Your pH should be between 4.5 to 8.0. So you always want to remember that your urinary pH should be between 4.5 to 8.0. And your 24 hour production should be between 1000 to 2000 mils. So that's approximately one meal per kg per hour. If we look at our serum uh, levels, our BUN should be between 10 to 20, and our creatinine should be between 0 0.7 to 1.4 milligram per DL. So this is where we want our ranges to be. If it deviates from any of these in either direction, that would tell you you could have problems with urinary elimination. Maybe the client is retaining uh, our uh, serum electrolytes, like your creatinine or the BUN. Again, our plan for our client with, to encourage urinary elimination would be, you want to keep him hydrated, uh, encourage adequate intake of between 1,500 to 2,000 meals per day. You want to know your client's voiding habits. You want to know their pattern. You want to provide time. You want to provide privacy for your client to allow them completely empty their bowels or their bladder. You also want to teach Kegel exercises. What does Kegel exercise do for you? It helps to strengthen the muscles of the pelvic floor. It helps to tighten the pelvic muscles. So you can tell the client, uh, I want to teach you Kegel exercise to help you with your urinary elimination. So I want you to tighten your pelvic muscles for a count of three, and then relax them again for another count of three. I want you to perform this lying down. I want you to repeat it again when you are sitting. I want you to repeat it when you are standing. So that's how you want to teach them Kegel exercises. You also want to teach, teach bladder retraining. So with bladder retraining, you want to help the client to begin to hold more urine for longer periods of time. So it's possible to train the bladder to do this by gradually increasing the time between the periods when you go to use the bathroom. So again, we want to carry out bladder retraining to help to the client to begin to hold more urine for a longer period of time. You also want to teach them triggering techniques. For example, uh, those, those techniques that can help to trigger uh, voiding, like stroking, stroking the medial aspect of the thigh. So you can stroke the medial aspect of, your, of the thigh, and that would help to trigger urination. You can also pinch the area above the groin. 
So by pinching the area above the groin, you can also trigger uh, voiding. You can also pull on the pubic hairs or provide digital anal stimulation. You can use your fingers to stimulate the anus. You can use your fingers to stimulate the anus. This is usually used with upper motor neuron problems. Or we can even carry out the Vasalva or even the Creed's maneuver. So what, how, how, what do you do or how do you carry out the Vasalva maneuver? You want to teach the client to try to exhale forcefully, attempt to exhale forcefully, but with their airway closed. So they try to close their airway or maybe close their mouth and you tell them, close your mouth and try to exhale forcefully or even by pinching their nose shut while trying to expel air as if they are blowing up a balloon. So that's your Vasava maneuver. This can help to uh, help with elimination or trigger that uh, uh, urination uh, reflex or even the Creed's maneuver. With Creed's maneuver, so that's your Creed's maneuver there, C-R-E-D-E. -E. Uh, with Creed's maneuver, uh, you exert manual pressure on the abdomen at the location of the bladder, just below the navel. So that would be another uh, technique to use to trigger voiding. We can also carry out intermittent catheterization every two to three hours, but that will be after attempting to void. So you can carry out intermittent catheterization every two to three hours after the client has attempted, the, attempted to void. But if the client attempts to void, uh, we need to catheterize them. And if we do, you want to look at what the volume of urine is. If the volume is less than 150 mil, then we can increase the period for catheterization uh, higher. For example, we said initially we want to catheterize every two to three hours. But if we catheterize and we are getting uh, urine of uh, less than 150 mil, we can increase the interval to three to four hours. If it's still less, we can increase to four to six hours. But again, you don't want to take more than eight hours to catheterize your client. So the less urine we get, the, in, the higher interval increment we carry out. So intermittent catheterization initially every two to three hours, depending on the volume of urine, the residual urine, if it's less than 150, we can increase the interval to three to four hours. If we check again, it's still less than 150, we can increase to four to six hours and so on and so forth. But you don't want to go more than eight hours without carrying out intermittent catheterization. We can also teach toileting schedules, like teach the client first thing in the morning, use the toilet, or maybe before meals or after meals, or maybe before and after physical activity, or even at bedtime, so you want to schedule when they use the toilet. Okay, again, you as a nurse, you also need to uh, respond immediately to calls. So you want to respond immediately to calls when the client calls and says, I need the bedpan, I need to use the restroom. You want to be there to attend to your clients. You also want to educate the client to avoid diuretics such as caffeine, we already said you need to encourage fluid intake up to 2,000 mil. And again, before we remove the catheter, we need to clamp our indwelling catheter intermittently before removal. So why, why do we clamp intermittently to allow uh, the bladder to fill with urine? That would help to restore bladder function before we now finally remove the catheter. So again, with indwelling catheters, we want to clamp them intermittently to allow the bladder to fill and help to restore bladder function. Again, with toilet training, especially in kids and children, you don't want to begin toilet training before 18th month of life. Um, for those that are between two to three years, they should have achieved bladder reflex control. For children between two to three years, they should have achieved bladder reflex control. At three years, regular voiding habits should have been established. At four years, they should have that independent ability to use the bathroom. And at five years, that nighttime uh, control is expected. Again, we need to know what enuresis means, which is that bed wetting in a child at least five years of age. So uh, usually they have small bladder capacity. It's usually more common in males. And it also occurs in children who tend to be very, very deep sleepers. 
with prostatic hypertrophy or benign prostatic hyperplasia. Here you're going to see enlargement of the prostate. So this is what the normal prostate should look like. Or you can see it's a whole lot enlarged in this picture. So there's enlargement of the prostate. And once it's enlarged, you can see the urinary outflow. And here it's kind of constricted. So there's going to be urinary flow obstruction. You can see incontinence. You can also see possible infection in your client. With benign hypertrophy, there's it usually uh, the occurrence increases with age, especially with clients over 50 years of age. And again, with more severe uh, chronic benign prostatic hypertrophy, uh, you will see symptoms such as blood creatinine will be increased, blood urea nitrogen, your BUM will be increased, and even hemoglobin. So we we'll need to assess all of this, assess the blood creatinine, BUN, and hemoglobin levels to rule out kidney damage and even anemia in your clients. And again, as part of screening protocols for prostate cancer, you want to measure your PSA, your prostate specific antigen. So measurement of specific prostate uh, antigen levels is recommended as part of screening protocols for prostate cancer. We can also carry out digital rectal examination is also one way to screen for prostate cancer. Again, remember with the normal PSA, the level is less than four milligram per meal. So that's what your normal level should be. Usually this PSA could be increased in prostatitis. It could be increased in prostatic hypertrophy and even in prostate cancer. In terms of our uh, assessment tests we can run, we can carry out a transabdominal or transrectal ultrasound. So you can see a probe is passed through the anus or is inserted through the rectum to check the prostate. So that's one way to, that's one diagnostic test. We can carry out a transurectal, um, a transrectal or transabdominal scan or a transrectal uh, ultrasound. So that's our probe there to help us to visualize the prostate or we can also carry out a prostate biopsy. So that's our biopsy gone and this is the prostate gland. So you have a needle here. We also have an ultrasound probe to guide this and then we can take a tissue sample. So what are the signs you will see with DPH? There's going to be frequent urination. Your clients will use the bathroom. Uh, more necessary, there is the need to urinate many times during the day or even at night or both in the day and in the night in normal or less than normal volumes. And that frequency may be accompanied by a sensation of an urgent need to void. So that's what we refer to as urinary urgency. They, has that, they have that urgency to void. You would also see difficulty starting the urine. Uh, you would also see weak urine stream. So you don't have the urine going where it's supposed to go because that pressure is reduced. So there could be that weak urine stream. You would also see dribbling at the end of urination. So you can see he has uh, wet himself. There's also inability to completely empty the bladder. And you could also see urinary tract infection in your client. There could be hematuria before or after voiding or that urinary retention. In terms of our plan, we can carry out conservative management. In conservative, conservative management, we want to use urinary antiseptics. So these are oral agents that have this antibacterial activity that only happens in the urine. So that the exact antibacterial activity in the urine, it doesn't have, uh, they have very little or no systemic antibacterial effects. So their usefulness is limited to the lower urinary tract uh, infections. We can also administer medications like our 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, for example, your finestera, finasteride and your dutasteride. So these are a class of medications that are used for benign prostatic hypertrophy. We can also give our alpha blocking medications. These medications are also used for high blood pressure and with, uh, they can be used in men with uh, enlargement of the prostate gland. So examples of your alpha blocking medications would be your 
alfuzoxin, dosazoxin, endoramine, prazosin, the, the more popular tamsulosin, and your terazosin. So these are your alpha blocking medications. Again, we can also carry out suprapubic cystostomy. So you can see the uh, stomy there tells me opening, suprapubic, okay? So above the pubic area. So this is a, you can see this is a surgically created connection between the urinary bladder and the skin. And it's used to drain urine from the bladder in individuals with obstruction to normal urinary flow. So there's an opening into the bladder and a drainage through a catheter through the abdominal wall. Uh, and this is actually a temporary measure to divert urine. So again, it's connected to a sterile closed drainage system. So you can see the bag, the drainage system. And if you want to test the client's ability to void, you want to clamp this catheter for four hours and have your client void. And then we want to unclamp the catheter and measure the residual urine in the bladder. If the residual is less than 100 ml on two occasions, then we can remove this catheter. Again, if your client has a suprapubic cystostomy, we want to check if, if we need to remove the catheter after a while. And how do we test for our client's ability to void? We want to clamp the catheter for at least four hours and have the client void as normally as he would. And then we can unclamp the catheter and measure the residual urine. If the residual is less than 100 ml on two occasions, maybe in the morning and then again in the evening, then the catheter is removed. Again, after removal of catheter, a sterile dressing is placed over the site. We can also carry out prostatectomy. So, ectomy tells me surgical removal, cutting into the removing. So, this is a a partial or complete removal of the prostate. So it can be a transurethral uh, prostatectomy. So here, uh, let me see, do I have it on this image? So usually, just as the name sounds, transurethral. So they are going in through the urethra. So here is a, is a surgical uh, resection of the prostate and it's performed by visualizing. So you can see they are visualizing the prostate through the urethra and the tissue is removed by electrocautery or by dissection. So you can see there's a cutting tool here to cut off uh, the tissue. So this is through the urethra. That's why it's called transurethral prostatectomy. You can also have suprapubic resection. So this means that the surgery is done through an incision in the lower abdomen above the pubic bone. You can also have a retropubic resection or even a perineal prostatectomy. So these are methods to, just as the name sounds, to surgically remove parts or all of the prostrate. As part of our management for this client, you always want to assess for shock and hemorrhage. So you want to check the dressing and the drainage. Again, urine may be reddish pink initially. So that should be expected. The urine may be reddish pink initially. In this client also, you want to monitor continuous bladder irrigation. So you can see our continuous bladder irrigation system in place. So here there's continuous this irrigating solution that goes into the bladder and then it drains out to our drainage bag. So with bladder irrigation, they are trying to flush sterile fluid through the catheter into the bladder. And this would help to remove and prevent blood from clotting in the bladder. Because these blood clots, if they are allowed to form, they will stop the urine from flowing out through the catheter. And then the urine will collect in the bladder and begin to cause pain. And the pain continues to get worse as the bladder uh, fills up. Again, in our clients, we need to monitor intake and output after the catheter is removed. So you want to monitor intake and output. You want to educate your client to avoid long periods of sitting and strenuous activity until the danger of bleeding is over. You also want to tell your client that uh, they should expect dribbling and urinary leakage around the wound where we put our tube into the bladder. You want to tell them 
respect leakage, they should respect dribbling around the tube. That's in the immediate period. Again, you want to, um, we can use complementary and alternative therapies, like giving our clients saw, palmetto, or even lycopene. So some of these have been shown to be um, helpful with enlarged prostate glands. We also need to teach our client to avoid consumption of large amounts of fluids and caffeine. We also want to avoid anticholinergics, antihistamines, and even decongestant medications. Remember, some of these, like your anticholinergic, can cause urinary retention. So we don't want them using anticholinergics in this period. Your antihistamines also can also cause those um, difficulty urinating and even constipation. So that's why we, won't, we don't want them using antihistamines during this period. And again, your decongestants, they could cause those dry mouth, uh, feeling restless, agitated. So we don't want our clients on any of these medications. Let's look at cystitis. Again, cystitis tells me bladder. Itis tells me inflammation. So this is inflammation of the bladder. What are the predisposing factors? It's usually uh, occurs more in females. Predisposing factors include catheterization. If you catheterize your client, they are more at risk of having cystitis or even if you use instruments. So instrumentation is another predisposing factor. In terms of assessment of this client, what are you going to see? The urine is going to be dark cloudy. There will be hematuria. There will be pain in the lower tummy. There will be pain and burning when the client pees. We have that strong smelling urine. There will be that urinary frequency and urgency. There would also be pain during sex and the client will feel malaise and fatigue. So there'll be that feeling of sickness and tiredness. In terms of our plan, what do we want to do for this client? We'll need to obtain a clean catch midstream urine specimen because we want to carry out urinalysis, we want to carry out urine culture, and we want to carry out colony count. So this is why we'll need uh, to ask our client to start to pee, and then we we'll collect a sample of urine midstream in a container. So it's not when they start peeing, it's midstream. That's when we are going to take our sample. Again, we want to encourage fluids up to 3,000 meals per day. We might need to give cranberry juice or other urinary acidifiers. This would help to control the pH in the urine. So if we give urinary acidifiers, it will help to inhibit uh, bacterial growth in our client's uh, system. So we we'll need to also carry out culture and sensitivity. We we'll need to place our clients on medications. We can give antibiotics like our sulfur, methoxazole, Tremotroprim, so we can give this. We can also give um, urinary tract analgesics like your phenazopyridine. So we can give antibiotics. We can also give urinary tract analgesics like our phenazopyridine. You also want to teach females to void before and after intercourse, and they will need to clean properly after defecation. So again, they want to wipe from the front to the back. And you want to teach them to void every two to three hours. With glomerulonephritis, glomerulo, glomerulus tells me kidney, the nephrons, nef nephro tells me ne nephrons, itis tells me inflammation. So this is obviously inflammation of the glomeruli, which are structures in the kidneys that are made up of tiny blood vessels. So with acute glomerulonephritis, which is usually uh, the most common type, is caused by streptococcal infection elsewhere in the body, like an upper respiratory infection or a skin infection. It can also be caused by autoimmune disease. So remember with autoimmune diseases, we said the body's immune system attacks healthy cells like a client who has a systemic lupus erythematosus. So SLE or lupus can affect the joints, the skin, 
the kidneys, and even the blood cells. It can affect the brain, the heart, and the lungs. So in this client, what are you going to see? We're going to see headaches. We're going to see the blood pressure is going to be elevated. There'll be facial and periorbital edema. So you're going to see swelling around the eyes and on the face. There will be malice. Your client will have low grade fever. There will be obvious weight gain. And you would see protein in the urine. You will see blood and the urinary output will be diminished. So those are what we are going to see in our clients. Again, you would also see with oliguria, in clients with glomerulonephritis, there's going to be oliguria with fixed specific gravity. When you have a client with, who is oliguric and the specific gravity remains fixed, that tells you there's impending renal failure. So how do we mean by fixed specific gravity? So for example, if the client's specific gravity is, let me say 1.010, and we keep giving fluids, we keep pumping in fluids, and the specific gravity remains at that value at 1.010, then that's what we mean by when we say there's fixed specific gravity. So if the client is not producing enough urine and the specific gravity remains fixed, that tells us that indicates impending renal failure. So what's our plan for our client with glomerulonephritis? We want to administer medications to eliminate infection, to alter that immune balance, to elevate the inflammation. We want to give medications to treat volume overload and hypertension. So we can give antibiotics, especially, remember we said there's going to be fever, there's infection, so we can give antibiotics. We can give corticosteroids. Remember, corticosteroids are going to help to lower inflammation in the body. They help to reduce immune system activity. They can ease swelling, itching, redness, and allergic reactions. So we can give our client corticosteroids. We can also give antihypertensives, uh, especially for those moderate to severe hypertension. Remember we said the blood pressure will be elevated in this client. We can also give immunosuppressive medications like your cyclosporine or your tacolimus. These immunosuppressant drugs, they suppress or reduce the strength of the body's immune system. Remember we said glomerulonephritis could be as a result of autoimmune disease. So we can give these immunosuppressant drugs to help. We can also give that diuretics. This would help with that dyspnea, that difficulty breathing. It will help with weight gain, to help with those long grills we hear when we listen to breath sounds. It would also help with fluid overload. Again, with this client, we want to reduce, restrict sodium intake. So again, you also want to restrict water intake if the client is oliguric. Remember we said oliguria is when the client urinates less than usual. So that means if the output is less than 400 mils a day, your client is oliguric. So if it's oliguric, you want to restrict sodium intake, you want to restrict uh, water intake. We also want to carry out daily weights assess intake and output and our client's serum potassium. We want to place the client on bed rest. Remember we said there will be fatigue, there will be malice. So we want to place them on bed rest. We want to give high calorie, low protein diet. We might need to carry out dialysis if there's uremia or plasma electrophoresis if renal failure develops. Remember plasma electrophoresis will help to remove all of those antibodies that are fighting the body's own system. With acute kidney injury, also known as acute renal failure, here you have a sudden episode of kidney failure or kidney damage that happens within a few hours or a few days. So once there's acute kidney injury, there's going to be a buildup of waste products in the blood, and it's going to make it hard for the kidneys to keep the right balance of fluid in the body. Remember, we want our GFR, our glomerular filtration rate to be in the green area above 60. But if we have our GFR below 15, that indicates kidney failure. So again, you want it to be above 60. So what are causes of acute kidney injury? 
it could be categorized into three. We have our pre-renal courses, our intra-renal courses, and even our post-renal courses. With pre-renal courses, there's going to be a sudden and severe drop in blood pressure, maybe as a result of shock or interruption of blood flow to the kidneys, maybe as a result of severe injury or illness. So that will be categorized as a pre-renal cause of renal failure. So with pre-renal cause, you have a condition that slows blood flow to the kidneys, maybe as a result of circulating volume depletion, or maybe a vascular obstruction or vascular resistance. You could also have intrarenal cause, which will be as a result of direct damage to the kidneys by maybe inflammation, toxins, drugs, infections, or even as a, re a result of reduced blood supply. So again, with intrarenal, you're going to see direct damage to the kidneys, maybe as a result of nephrotoxic drugs, or even a transfusion reaction or trauma, or even severe muscle exertion. Remember, with muscle tissue breakdown, it, there will be uh, production of toxins as the muscle tissues are destroyed. So what are you going to have? All these toxins are going to continue to build up and it could cause intrarenal damage to the kidneys. It could even be as a result of genetic conditions like your polycystic kidney disease. So this would be an inherited disorder in which clusters of cysts develops in the kidneys. Remember, these cysts in, the, in polycystic kidney disease are non-cancerous and they only contain water-like fluid. They can grow very large, but again, they are non-cancerous. And finally, we could have our post-renal causes. So here, uh, we have sudden ob obstruction of urine flow, maybe due to an enlarged prostate or kidney stones or bladder tumor or injury. So those will be regarded as post-renal causes. So what are the signs you will see with acute kidney injury? They are broken down into phases. In the oligoric phase or the elic phases or the onset phase of kidney injury, our urine output is going to be less than 400 mils in 24 hours, which we said would be oliguria. And it can occur within one to seven days of kidney injuries. There would be cast. If you do a urinalysis, you will see cast in the urine. You will see red blood cells. So there will be blood in the urine. We'll see white blood cells. Again, our specific gravity will be fixated at 1.010. Remember I said uh, fixed specific gravity is when we are giving fluid and giving fluids, but our specific gravity remains unchanged. So you're going to see that in the oligoric phase of acute kidney injury. There would also be metabolic acidosis. Our potassium level will be elevated. Our sodium level will be depleted. So there will be hyperkalemia and hyponatremia. There would also be elevated bone, BUN and creatinine levels and the clients will complain of fatigue and malaise. In the diuretic phase, there's a gradual increase in urine output between one to three liters per day. It may even reach up to three to five liters per day. So in the diuretic phase, just as the name sounds, there's diuresis, there's gonna be a gradual increase in urine output that goes up to at least one to three liters per day and up to three to five liters per day. And then the client will, will be hypovolemic and he will be dehydrated as a result of this excess fluid loss. He would also be hypotensive as he's, reading all, as he's losing all of these fluids. And then there's gonna be normalization of the BUN and the creatinine levels. Remember we said they were initially elevated, but as he's losing all these fluids, is losing some of this and the BUN and creatinine levels begin to normalize. In the recovery phase, this begins when the GFR increases and BUN levels begin to plateau and then they begin to drop. So that's our recovery phase. Then the client begins to recover from the assault. With chronic kidney disease, what are, what are the immediate causes of chronic kidney disease? Um, it could be caused by hypertension, diabetes mellitus, lupus erythematosus. Remember we said lupus is that condition in which the immune system attacks its own tissue. 
and then it causes widespread inflammation and tissue damage in the affected organs. And again, we said it could affect the joints, it could affect the skin, it could affect the brain, it could affect the lungs, it could affect the kidneys, it could also affect blood vessels. Another cause of chronic kidney disease would be sickle cell disease, chronic glomerulonephritis, repeated pyelonephritis. Remember pyelonephritis is a type of urinary tract infection. We'll still look at, we'll look at it down the line during the course, but it affects, uh, here you see urinary tract infection that begins in the urethra or even in the bladder and ascends upwards to one or both of the kidneys. So that could also cause chronic kidney disease. Another cause could be polycystic kidney disease. We already talked about this. Remember, it's an inherited disorder in which you have clusters of cysts that begin to develop within the kidneys, causing the kidneys to enlarge and causing them to lose function over time. Like we said, these cysts are non-cancerous and they only contain fluids. Another cause again would be nephrotoxins. So what do you see in your client with chronic renal failure? There would be that decreased ability to concentrate urine. You would have polyguria that later uh, changes to oliguria. Our kidney values will be elevated. Your BUM will be elevated. Your serum creatinine will be elevated. Our blood pressure will be elevated. Serum potassium will be elevated. The client would complain of, uh, there will be mild anemia in this client. And the GFR progressively decreases from 90 to 30 mils per minute. Remember we said we want our GFR to be above 60. So you will see GFR progressively decreasing from 90 to 30 mils per minute. And again, there will also be edema in your clients. So part of our plan for acute kidney disease would be to carry out dialysis. It could be hemodialysis. It could be peritoneal dialysis. Again, with hemodialysis, you can access your client through a central venous catheter or through an AV graft or an AV fistula. Remember with an AV fistula, here you have, so these are AV fistula. So you have a connection of an artery to a vein. So you have a connection of an artery to a vein and it's used to remove and return blood during hemodialysis. With our AV grafts, here there's a connection of a vein and an artery using a graft, using a hollow synthetic tube. So an artery is connected to a vein through a hollow synthetic tube. It's also, we can use this line also to carry out hemodialysis. What are complications that could arise from this procedure? One complication would be hemorrhage, there could be bleeding, there could be hepatitis, the client could have developed nausea and vomiting. Very importantly, there could be disequilibrium syndrome. So here you're going to see headache and you're going to see mental confusion. With dialysis, disequilibrium syndrome is actually a state of cerebral edema as a result of urea being removed faster from the blood than from the brain and the CSF. So again, when you have you are dialyzing your patient and urea is being removed faster from the blood and at a slower rate from the brain and from the cerebrospinal fluid, it's going to create a, a urea osmotic gradient. So that retention of that uh, urea in the brain is what is going to cause this, this equilibrium syndrome. So you're going to see headache, you're going to see mental confusion in your clients. And it's most commonly on cause in first few dialysis sessions. So you want to keep an eye for your client who is a new dialysis patient because he could develop this uh, disequilibrium syndrome. You can also see it in the elderly and pediatric patients, and even in patients with pre-existing CNS issues like head trauma or even stroke. Other complications that could arise would be muscle cramps, air embolism, and even sepsis. So those are other complications that could arise in your client that's carrying out hemodialysis. 
So what's our plan for this client? What's our nursing concentration? You always want to check for a trail and a bridge every eight hours. So you always want to check for a trail and a bridge every eight hours. So again, one way to remember this is to hear a bridge and feel a thrill. Feel, thrill. Hear a bridge, feel a thrill. So when you check for a bridge, you want to use your stethoscope to listen to a bridge. And to check for a thrill, you want to use maybe your fingers or your hands to feel the thrill. Normally, uh, <coughs> A, a normal, a healthy AV fistula has a breath, that rumbling sound that you can hear. And it also has a thrill, which is that rumbling sensation that you can feel. And it's a good indicator of how well the dialysis access point is functioning. So you always want to check that every eight hours. Again, you don't want to use the extremity for blood pressure or to obtain blood specimens. You want to monitor the client's blood pressure, apical pulse, temperature, respiration, breath sounds, and even weight. Also monitor for hemorrhage during dialysis and one hour after procedure. So while the dialysis is ongoing, you want to monitor for hemorrhage and even one hour after the procedure. With peritoneal dialysis, so this is a type of dialysis which uses the peritoneum in, the person's, in a person's abdomen as the membrane through which fluid and dissolved substances are exchanged with the blood. So you can see that's our diacinate over there and it's drained into the abdomen and then we drain it out. So when all of the waste and fluid and chemicals have been absorbed into the diacinate, it's then drained out into our drainage bag. So what are, what's the procedure for carrying out our peritoneal dialysis? It's very important that you want to weigh your client before and after this peritoneal dialysis. Again, the catheter is cleansed and attached to a line that is leading to the peritoneal uh, cavity. So our catheter is attached to this line that is leading to the peritoneal cavity. And then the, we already said this is dialysis. Dialysis is infused into the peritoneal cavity to the prescribed volume. And then the dialysate is then drained from the abdomen after the prescribed amount of time. So what are complications that could arise? There could be protein loss. There could be peritonitis, which would be inflammation of the membrane that is lining the abdominal wall and covering the abdominal organs. So we could have peritonitis. And what are the signs for you to know your client is developing peritonitis? You would notice a cloudy outflow there could be bleeding, there could be fever, there could be abdominal tenderness and even lower back pains, lower back problems. Your client can develop nausea and vomiting. You could even see exit site infection, so where the catheter passes through could be infected. There could also be hypotension and hypovolemia in your client. Again, part of your nursing consideration would also include knowing that constipation may cause problems with infusion and outflow. So you want to give high fiber diet and also give stool softeners. So remember, constipation may cause problems with infusion and outflow with peritoneal dialysis. So you want to give a high fiber diet and stool softeners. And if there's problem with outflow, if you notice our diacylate is not draining as it should, you might try to reposition your client, maybe put him in a supine or low fowler's position, or you can even move him from side to side to make sure all of the diacylate flows out. Again, we already said you need to monitor the client's blood pressure and vital signs. You want to monitor his weight, very important. You want to monitor your client's weight. And again, we always want to clean the catheter insertion site and apply sterile dressing. As part of our considerations for acute kidney disorders, we want to monitor potassium levels. If the potassium levels are elevated, you can give your chiaxalate or our sodium polystyrene sulfate. It's also known as chiaxalate. You could give it orally or we can give it as a retention enema 
if our potassium levels are elevated. Again, in the oliguric phase, we want to use diet, we want to limit fluids, we want to restrict protein, potassium, and sodium in the oliguric phase. After the diuretic phase, we want to give high carbohydrate diets. We still need to restrict protein, potassium, and sodium. And then if there's chronic failure, you want to regulate protein intake. You also want to regulate fluid intake to balance fluid losses. There should also still be some restriction of sodium and potassium. And we could also give vitamin supplements. We can also give aluminum hydroxide for elevated phosphate levels. We will need to place our client on bed rest, especially during the acute phase. We will need to also monitor for infection. If we have any infections, we can give antibiotics. For at some point, if our client would be requiring kidney transplant, we need to consider our donor selection in terms of the kidney that wants to be transplanted. Is it coming from a cadaver, which would be uh, from a, a dead donor, or is it coming from either an identical twin? You also want to consider tissue uh, match and even histocompatibility. So you want to be sure that the tissue can coexist with the tissue of another individual without the immune system rejecting it. So if a tissue donor and a tissue recipient are histocompatible, then a transplant is expected to be easily accepted. So we want to consider all of this. Preoperative client education, you want to show the client where the donated kidney will be located. So this is where the initial kidney used to be, or you can see where the new uh, kidney or the donated kidney will be located. So you want to teach your client that. You want to explain the surgical procedure. Um, so tell your client the new kidney is going to be located in the iliac fossa, anterior to the iliac crest. So it's going to be located in the iliac fossa, anterior to the iliac crest. Uh, we would also need to use immunosuppressive drugs like our prednisone, imuran, cyclosporin, so again, remember with immunosuppressive drug, the most significant side effect is that increased risk of infection. So you want to keep an eye on your client for any signs of infection if it's on an immunosuppressive drug. There's also need for infection prevention, most especially if our client is on immunosuppressive drugs. With post-operative client care, you want to monitor vital signs especially the intake and output. So initially, we, you want to expect a scant urine production for several weeks. So there is expected if we have scanty urine production, well, urine production for several weeks. We want to monitor clients' weight. You want to carry out good vascular access care. Remember, until these newly transplanted kidneys begin to function uh, maximally, our clients may need hemodialysis at least from two to three weeks. So you want to carry out good vascular access care while our client is still on hemodialysis until the new transplanted kidneys begin to function as they should. Again, we would also need to carry out psychological support for the donor and also for the recipient. Again, with kidney transplants, Postoperatively, you want to monitor for complications. Complications such as hemorrhage, such as shock. There could be also rejection, post-kidney transplant rejection. And what are the rejection signs you should look out for? If there's going to be acute rejection, you can see the kidney is flying away, it's being rejected by the body. This could occur one week to two years postoperatively. You would see oliguria, where the urine output would be less than 400 mils. In 24 hours, you will see anuria. There will be fever. There will be increased blood pressure. The client will complain of flank tenderness, lethargy, and there will be decreased specific gravity and fluid retention. So these are signs you will see if there's going to be acute rejection. 
With chronic rejection, it can occur over months to years, and you will keep seeing a gradual steady increase in the BUN levels, in the creatinine levels. You would also see electrolyte imbalance and also fatigue. So all of this would tell you there is possible post-kidney transplant rejection. Again, you want to monitor for uh, complications such as infection, pulmonary complications, and also those adverse effects of the immunosuppressive and steroid medications we talked about. Remember, those adverse effects of your steroids or your corticosteroids would include osteoporosis, avascular necrosis, cataracts, lucus intolerance, even infections. So you want to look out for all of this. We briefly mentioned pyelonephritis, but let's quickly run through it. So with pyelonephritis, we said pylo tells me our renal pelvis. So again, you are going to see inflammation of the kidney due to urinary tract infection. And again, remember we said this infection usually begins in the urethra or the bladder and then travels upwards to the kidneys. So what could predispose your client to pyelonephritis? Urinary tract infection will be one. Pregnancy is also another predisposing factors, tumors, urinary obstruction. And again, remember, this infection is usually caused by E. coli. For our diagnostic tests, you want to carry out urinalysis where we'll see red blood cells, we'll see bacteria, we'll see leukocyte casts in the urine. In terms of our assessment of our clients, the client is going to have chills and fever because we said it's an infection, there's inflammation, there's going to be malice. The client will complain of flank pain, will also complain of urinary frequency and painful urination. There would also be CVA tenderness, coastal vertebral angle tenderness. Remember, this is our angle here that's formed by the 12th rib and the spine. That's where you have the kidneys located. So they're going to complain when you touch this region, this coastal vertebral angle. And the client complains of tenderness. That tells you, or that indicates kidney pathology. So that's what you're going to see if you um, assess this client. In terms of our plan, we might need to put our client on bed rest during the acute phase. We need to carry out antibiotic therapy, give antiseptics, analgesics, and we also need to encourage fluid intake up to 300 meals or 3,000 meals per day. So let's briefly look at congenital malformations of the urinary tract. Uh, we just have only three we would like to talk about here. So this is a normal urethral opening, and this would be hypospadias. So you can see with hypospadias, the urethral is opening on the ventral surface of the penis. So it's opening on the ventral surface of the penis, while epispadias, the urethral opening is opening on the dorsal surface of the penis. So with both, we'll need to carry out surgical correction, we don't want to carry out circumcision because we will need the foreskin to be used in surgical repair. So you want to tell the parents don't carry out circumcision initially because we will need that excess foreskin to use and carry out surgical repair of either our hypospadias or our epispadias. Another con congenital malformation of the urinary tract would be bladder estrophy. So here, the surfaces of the bladder are exposed. The posterior and the lateral surface of the bladder is exposed. Here, we need to carry out reconstructive surgery to close the bladder and abdominal wall. So you can see what it looks like, and this uh, when it has been corrected. So this is all referred to as bladder estrophy. Again, with congenital malformations, you want to always evaluate if the parents have adjusted to the altered body image of their infant. So that's key. And again, has reconstructive surgery been successful? That's also one thing you want to consider. Let's look at kidney and ureteral calculi. So first of all, I want to start with nephrolithiasis. So again, lithiasis will be 
stones. So nephro tells me kidney. So here would be kidney stones. And urethro tells me urethra. And this would be stones in the urethra. So again, it could be caused by maybe obstruction and urinary stasis. It could also be caused by high, hypercalcemia, even dehydration, immobility, gout. Remember, gout would be that arthritic pain and inflammation when too much uric acid crystallizes and deposits in the joints. So all of those uric acid could also cause stones in either the kidneys or the urethra. Even increased intake of oxalates like spinach, Swiss chard, wheat jam, peanuts, all of these could cause this condition. When you assess your client, so those are our stones in the kidneys. So this is in the bladder uh, and this would be in the urethra. So again, what do we see in our client when we assess the client? They always complain of renal colic. So they will always complain of pain. And again, this depends on the location of the stone. If it's a renal calculi, they will complain of flank pain. Uh, but if it's a urethra or bladder stone, they will complain of radiating flank pain. So they will have this radiating flank pain. And the pain is often very severe. You will see the client is diaphoretic. They will develop nausea and vomiting, fever and chills. And if carry out urinalysis, we would see blood in the urine, WBCs in the urine, and even bacteria in the urine. What's our plan? We want to monitor intake and output, and even the client's temperature. We want to avoid overhydrating or underhydration to decrease pain when passing the stone. Again, always remember to strain the urine and check the pH of your urine. So this is a urine strainer. So it's used to collect a uh, kidney stone from urine stream. So you want to strain the uh, urine. We we'll need to also give analgesics and diets for prevention of stones. Remember, most stones contain calcium, phosphorus, and oxalates. So for example, we can give diet that is low in calcium if the stones are due to excessive dietary calcium. So you want to tell your client to avoid milk, avoid dairy, dairy products, to avoid cheese if the stones are due to uh, excessive dietary intake of calcium. Again, we can also advise diet that is low in sodium because sodium increases calcium in the urine. So you want to advise a diet low in sodium. And we also want to advise diet that are low in oxalate to prevent increased calcium absorption. So you want to tell them to avoid spinach, avoid cola, avoid chocolates, avoid tea. So you want to remove all of this uh, to prevent increased calcium absorption that can end up in the kidneys or the urethras. You also want them to avoid vitamin D enriched foods. So avoid vitamin D enriched foods because it increases calcium absorption. You also want to tell them to decrease purine sources like organ meats. So they need to decrease purine sources. And again, we'll try to make the urine alkaline. So try to make the urine alkaline, like restrict citrus fruits, milk, potatoes, and to acidify the urine. So you want them to increase consumption of eggs, cranberry juice, and even fish. We might need to give drug therapy like our antibiotics. We can give broad spectrum antibiotics. We can also give thiazide diuretics, autophosphates, sodium cellulose phosphates. This would help to decrease calcium reabsorption. We can also give allopurinol, which will help to decrease urine acid, acid levels. We can also give vitamin B6 or our pyridoxine. This would also help to decrease oxalic acid levels. We can carry out mechanical intervention like cytoscopy with catheter insertion. This would help to remove the stones. We can also carry out uh, extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. We can carry out extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. So in this procedure, we are using shockwaves to break apart kidney stones. 
So again, after the procedure, you always want to strain the urine. You want to strain the urine and the stones are sent to the lab for analysis. You want to encourage fluid intake to facilitate passage of broken stones and teach the client to report fever, decreased urinary output, and even pain. So you want to teach them to report fever, decreased urinary output, and pain. And finally, hematuria is expected in the initial, uh, in the early stages, but it should clear in 24 hours. So again, with extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy, hematuria is expected, but it should clear in 24 hours. And finally, we're going to end with urinary diversions. So these are surgical procedures that create a new way for urine to exit the body when there is urinary flow obstruction, or maybe when there's a need to bypass a diseased area in the urinary tract. So what clients can require urinary diversions? Maybe bladder tumors that require cystectomy. So any bladder tumor that requires surgical removal of all or part of the urinary bladder, we might need to divert the urine. We might need to divert urine in birth defects, <coughs> in strictures and traumas to urethras and urethra. In clients with neuro neurogenic bladder, with neuro neurogenic bladder, this is a urinary condition in people who lack bladder control, maybe due to a brain problem or a spinal cord problem or a nerve problem. And this nerve damage can be the result of maybe disease processes like even diabetes or Parkinson's disease or multiple sclerosis. We need to also carry out urinary diversion in clients with interstitial cystitis. So this is actually a chronic and painful bladder condition. Most times it's often mistaken for a urinary tract infection, but there's actually no infection in interstitial cystitis. What you see is a chronic painful bladder condition. And symptoms you will see with interstitial cystitis would be bladder pain, even pelvic pain, or pelvic pressure or bladder pressure. And they will have that frequent urge to urinate. So that's what you're going to see. Those are conditions that may require urinary diversion. So what are the types of urinary diversion? We can carry out a nephrostomy. So here, there will be a flank incision and then insertion of a nephrostomy tube into the renal pelvis. So there's going to be a flank incision and insertion of a nephrostomy tube into the renal pelvis. So with this kind of uh, procedure, we will need to put a penrose drain. Remember, a penrose drain is a flexible rubber tube that is used to surgically drain a site. So you don't want fluid building up in that surgical site. So that's why you're putting a penrose drain. So we need to put a penrose drain and also surgically dress the area. Another urinary diversion would be ureter ureterosigmoidostomy. Ureterosigmoidostomy. Here, the ureters are connected. They are detached from the bladder and connected or anastomosed to the sigmoid colon. So that's where the name comes from, ureteral, that is the urethra, sigmoid, so that's the sigmoid colon, ostomy. So an opening is created and is connected to the sigmoid colon. So here, both urine and stool are evacuated through the anus. So you want to encourage voiding through the rectum every two to four hours. So we don't want to give enemas or cathartics to these clients. And we want to monitor for complications. Which complications would you be expecting in this kind of uh, procedure? There could be fluid and electrolyte imbalance. So you want to look out for that. Look out for fluid and electrolyte imbalance. You want to look out for pyelonephritis, which we said would be uh, infections or inflammation of the kidney, renal pelvis. You could also look out for obstruction. That would be another complication you want to look out for in a client that has undergone this procedure. Another urinary diversion would be cutaneous ureterostomy. Cutaneous ureterostomy. So here you see either a single, so it could be a single 
or a double barrel stoma that is formed from the ureters. So they are, the ureters are cut off from the bladder and brought out through the skin into the abdominal wall. And most times, or most commonly, the stoma is usually constructed on the right side of the abdomen below the waistline. Again, you need to carry out extensive nursing intervention because of that alteration in body image. So that would be a priority for you to carry out extensive intervention due to that alteration in body image. And last but not the least, so these are other urinary diversions. We can carry out an iliocondit. So here, a portion of the terminal ileum is used as a conduit. So the ureters are replanted into the ileal segment and the distal end is brought out through the skin and forms a stoma. So you can see they are going to harvest a portion of the small bowel and then the, this ileum is used as a conduit to drain urine from the bladders. So this is one of the most common urinary diversion so as usual, you want to check for obstruction. Postoperatively, you can see mucus threads. Postoperatively, you can see mucus threads from the stoma, but again, these are expected postoperatively. It's normal. So you should expect to see mucus threads from the ileal condates. We can also have our cox pouch or continent ileal condate. Here, the ureters or the ureters are transplanted to an isolated segment of the ileum after a pouch has been formed. And then you have a one-way valve that is created. So the urine is drained by a catheter. So it's, it's called a continent ileocondit because of this one-way valve. The urine can only be drained using a catheter. So it gives you a form of, uh, uh, the client is more continent in holding or evacuating their urine. So your nursing consideration would be to note that, remember urine collects in this pouch and it will only be drained by catheter. So you want to take note of that in your Cox pouch. And this valve prevents leakage of urine, which is a good thing. So this is a skin and you have this valve that's gonna prevent leakage of urine. And the drainage of urine by the catheter is under the control of the client. And you want to teach the client that the pouch must be drained at regular intervals. And to round it all up, we're gonna carry out our last quiz. The client arrives in the physician's office complaining of insomnia, decreased appetite, weight loss due to a recent job loss. The physician diagnoses the client with generalized anxiety disorder and prescribes two common anti-anxiety medications. The client ex expresses concern to the nurse about taking medications for the symptoms and asks about alternative for treating the anxiety, the nurse's best action is to dash. Uh, I'm not sure how this question got here. It's not directly related to our topic of discourse for today. But again, like we always say, for therapeutic communication questions, you want to answer questions like a Nigerian. So even though we have so much information here, you want to be able to decipher your topic out of the maze of plenty text. So they are asked, you, you want to determine the here and now problem because that's the one you need to attend to, the here and the now problem. So if your client's current problem now is a breathing problem, then you're going with a breathing answer. If he has a circulatory problem now, that's what you want to address. Again, you don't want to pass the book on communication problems. You don't want to say, let me call the, the Catholic priest or let me call the physician. There must be something you can do before you pass the book. On the light of that, option C would be our correct answer. You want to educate the client in various relaxation techniques while determining which seems most appealing to the clients. So on this note, I would like to say thank you everyone for joining. Uh, if you have any questions, we can take them now. Thank you very much.